Okay. So, I hope you got some food into you, some energy, and you're not too sleepy. Um, because now you guys get to work. You could have kept, you know, when I was in, in primary school, we would always ask questions to keep the, the teachers busy so that we wouldn't get around to the, the homework. Um, but you guys didn't ask many questions, so we're going to work all afternoon. You're going to work all afternoon. Um, I did promise a couple of comments about fitness for use of data and GBIF. And I just put together one slide and a couple of illustrations. But I think it's a pretty important point. Um, data initiatives can make this a priority or not. But you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So if you, uh, if an initiative, GBIF or Vertnet or uh, the South America, South African efforts, if you make data quality a priority, you certainly spend resources. But at the same time, you earn benefits as well. And that is in terms of credibility. So um, I just wanted to kind of point out some, some important details about this. GBIF is just one more initiative, but it's also the biggest. And unfortunately, sometimes we're all judged as if ever, all of these data initiatives were the same. So, over a very long time, essentially most or all of GBIF's existence, it has been given clear signals uh, that fitness for use of data is crucial. For example, its science committee. For example, its forward look committee, just in the last five years, have said no substitute for very intensive focus on making these data usable, credibly usable. And I think many, I'll speak for myself, I feel that GBIF has skirted the issue and avoided it. And I think that's a mistake. But I'll just give you a couple comments about that. Where GBIF data are in some sense, quality controlled looks like this. I just did a query on United States. And so essentially, literally, can you believe that there are tens of millions of records summarized in this and there's not a single record that's wrong? Well, what this is, is a cookie cutter. They took the ge geographic coordinates and they just said territorial United States and in the ocean plus 200 miles, right? U.S. territorial waters. And so this is kind of data cleaning in the sense of I'm only going to let you see the stuff that looks clean and I'm just going to mask and discard all those other data. So for example, the Kenyan records of South American birds <coughs> fall under Kenya, but because they don't have any coordinates, they just stay there. They're like stealth garbage, right? They just stay there and you don't get rid of them because there are no other data other than Kenya. So this is kind of a, a cheap and easy data cleaning. And remember those DAK leaks. Those data that got filtered out might be important data. And if you plug those leaks, instead of just covering them up, you're actually building more usable data. You know, GBIF is trumpeting very loudly, 405 million records served. Sounds like McDonald's, doesn't it? Um, but really, of those 405 million records that they serve, how many are useful? 
In North America, because of that silly focus on numbers, there's too much redundancy. And you saw in Kenya, where we could use every record we could get, you saw a lot of garbage, a lot of dirt. So that kind of data cleaning, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't really cut the mustard, doesn't really do it. What GBIF really needs is a serious institutional commitment, a push to improve fitness for use. And that includes georeferencing by full quantitative documented protocols. The usual standard is the MANUS protocol. Um, there are excellent tools for data cleaning, and when you can't clean, at least you signal where there's dirt. And remember, of all the dirt I found in that Kenya data set, I think it was 350 records that were signaled, that were flagged. If a record is flagged as having problems, that's fine, because an intelligent user will search and say, okay, I don't want any taxonomic problems in here. So if I see a taxonomic problem flag, I'm going to remove that record. But you just saw there's essentially no flagging. So those three things, and I'm talking years and years of work by a lot of people, but I'm also talking using GBIF's rather unique stature as a global network to organize and coordinate. This task of georeferencing, if we had a clever institutional focus on that, that task could be done as a first pass via automated means, essentially matching to electronic gazetteers to the lowest level possible. If it's to the locality, great. If it's to the county, great. If it's to the state, eh. if it's to the country, oh, <laughs> right? But you do the first pass automated, and then you find the experts who will frequently be the participants in GBIF who live in that place. You find the experts, you provide them with tools and training to do that cleanup, and you just saw for Kenya. The yield for Kenya is an immediate doubling of data available. That's pretty cool, if you do it. So that to me is very, very critical. Um, the other thing that GBIF has not done, when it does do cleaning and improvements and things like that, is it's basically just a lens at the portal stage. But there's not been any thought of pushing those improvements back to the providers. Now that's tough, because data owners, you know, museums and, and data managers at institutions, don't like to be told how to manage their own data. Okay, and we did face these problems in the VertNet networks, because we had these cooperative groups that were geographically structured doing the georeferencing, and then pushing, in VertNet we did push the improvements back to the providers, but we were pushing changes to databases back to these databases, and some of them were like, hey, don't tell us to do how to do our business. And that was a hard lesson in Manus, and it was an easier lesson in HerpNet, and by the time that Ornus came around, it wasn't such a big problem. But GBIF has made no efforts along those lines. So I think these are really, really unfortunate strategic decisions along the way. They can still be corrected, but now you have 400 million records to deal with instead of just 50 million. So the longer you wait, the harder it gets. So I showed you that. Um, here's a, an example, records of Grillaria hypoluca. 
and I drilled down to the original record and and there's, you know, typically these kind of empty data fields, very typically. But this is a place. And, well, that county is actually country, that's Colombia. There's a little garbage that I happened on without even noticing. That is a state and that is the country. You can get to this place and get its coordinates. Easy. I bet any of you can do it on Google in a second. Okay, so this is not a big challenge, except that it's a big data set. And so the longer you delay, the harder it gets. And then you get bad publicity. You know, for example, a paper like this, how global is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility? You know, and obviously it's not global. Obviously, there are big gaps, and you can see these kind of thumbnail figures. But the point is, the scientific community is being very cautious. I mean, the usership of GBIF data is taking off. Wonderful, great. But the scientific community is rightfully being a little bit cautious about this data portal that serves huge amounts of completely uncurated data. Again, I think that's a mistake. 